Thanks to everybody for attending this morning. So I'm going to extend the discussion about cancer immunotherapy and uh, focus on work from my own lab that uh, emphasizes the use of mouse models of cancer to try to understand the dynamic relationship that exists between cancers and the immune system. It's our view that we need to understand that in detail, scientific detail, before we can figure out better ways to mobilize the immune system in the treatment of cancer. Uh, as Daryl alluded to in his presentation, there's tremendous excitement based on clinical experiences, but tremendous uncertainty about which patients will respond and which will not, and how we can make those non-responders respond. It's difficult to do those scientific investigations in human patients, though not impossible, and groups are trying. Um, but we have felt for a while that using mouse models of the disease, we might be able to contribute to that effort. So that's what I'm going to describe over the next 20 minutes or so, leaving time, I hope, for questions. After which, I will have to rush out of here into a car to Logan Airport to attend the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on cancer. So I apologize for being so, so quick in my departure. So everybody here knows that cancer cells arise from normal cells through mutations in cellular genes. These promote proliferation as well as invasion and metastasis. Um, but you also know that cancer is much more complex. It involves interactions with many cells of the body. And for the purposes of this presentation, importantly, interactions with cells of the immune system, which can both promote and inhibit tumorigenesis. Because of these complex interactions between cells in, in the body um, for many years now, we have been using in vivo systems to study tumorigenesis so that we can begin to explore and tease apart these various interactions. This has come in the form of genetically engineered mouse models of cancer. We have many such models in the laboratory. A main focus of our work is lung cancer, and specifically adenocarcinoma of the lung, which happens to be leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States and worldwide. Uh, this involves activating mutations in the KRAS oncogene, loss of function mutations in the p53 tumor suppressor gene, and we activate and inactivate these genes in a spe cell-specific fashion within the lung by introducing Cre recombinase on the back of a virus. The virus infects individual cells within the lung. RAS turns on, p53 turns off, and this is enough to initiate cancers in C2. These then progress locally as well as in the form of metastasis. And this is what the disease looks like. It actually resembles quite closely the development of human adenocarcinomas, at least histopathologically, from, adeno, from hyperplasias to adenomas. Uh, uh, early stage adenocarcinomas, invasive adenocarcinomas, as I mentioned, metastasis. So for the purposes of this talk, though, the central question is, does the immune system see these tumors as they're developing? Because that would be a prerequisite for us to study the interactions between the immune system and the developing tumor. So Michael Dupage, now several years ago, asked this question, and he came to the starting, startling conclusion, they do not. That is to say, if we look for the presence of B cells or T cells in the tumor microenvironment, we find very little evidence of an immune response to these cancers. In fact, if we try to develop tumors in animals lacking an immune system, lacking B cells and T cells, RAG, mutant mice, the tumors develop equally well, not faster, not more extensively, equally well compared to wild-type mice. This, again, is a, a um, suggestion, at least, that the immune system does not surveil the development of these genetically engineered models. We now think we understand that, because we've done genome sequencing of these tumors, and we find very few somatically acquired mutations. We find a very small number of protein-altering mutations in these tumors. Thus, the tumors have very few antigens for the immune system to see. They are stealth to the immune system. So in that respect, it's not surprising that you don't see a strong immune response, perhaps in contrast to human cancers, human lung cancers, which have hundreds of protein-altering mutations and therefore a much greater likelihood of having antigens. So faced with this challenge, Michael Dupage, now some years ago, decided to overcome it by providing the tumors with an antigen for the immune system to see. I call this reading the tumor its Miranda rights, if you, don't, if you can't afford an antigen of your own, we'll provide one for you. And that's the case here. We've provided two, actually, two strong T cell antigens. This pointer is failing me, sadly. Um, two strong antigens 
um, one OVA-1 peptide as well as the 2C recognized peptide in the hopes that this would be enough to stimulate an immune response. As I mentioned, this work was published now five years ago, but uh, I'll just summarize it for you. Basically, what he found in this setting was that indeed, when you provide antigens for the immune system to see in this naturally arising tumor, the immune system sees it. So now, in contrast to the picture I showed you before, we see a tumor here and many here CD45 positive cells. It's actually both B cells and T cells infiltrating into the tumor proper. So it's not a problem of the immune system getting into a tumor like this. It just needs something to see, and it does in this setting. And that is effective in the sense that if you compare antigen-expressing tumors in black, if somebody has an extra pointer, that would be helpful. Antigen-expressing tumors in black compared to non-antigen-expressing tumors in white, the antigen-expressing tumors do less well. They don't grow as extensively in the, in the presence of the antigen. We know that this is immune cell dependent because if you do this experiment in a rag mutant background, you don't see any difference between the two. Okay, so the immune system is having an effect here. That's the good news. The bad news is that it doesn't last. This is true at eight weeks and at 16 weeks, but not true at 24 weeks. Ah, okay, thanks very much. Yeah, not true at 10, 24 weeks where you can see that the antigen expressing tumors have caught up. Okay? Now, the simple explanation for why it is that these tumors escape is that they've lost the expression of the antigen, or they've down-regulated MHC class 1. This is so-called immunoediting. That's not the explanation here. These tumors continue to express the antigen. It's just that the immune system shuts off. Um, and we can observe that by now seeing that in this later stage tumor, we have lots of healthy tumor cells, but no T cells within the tumor proper. Instead, the T cells are hanging out at the edges. Uh, not doing very much. And as you'll see in a second, these T cells have the phenotype of exhaustion. They look like the kind of T cells that are failing to react to human tumors, for which we now think checkpoint therapy might be effective. So we're recapitulating this immunosuppression that takes place in the context of at least many human cancers. Importantly, these observations, which are occurring in the naturally arising tumor, are context-dependent. We see this in the naturally arising tumor, but importantly, we see a very different thing if we transplant these cells subcutaneously into a recipient mouse. So Michael did that experiment. He isolated tumor-derived cell lines from these animals and then transplanted them into recipient mice in the same way that most immunotherapy studies are done in mouse models. And in this situation, the only tumors that ever grew out were ones that had either down-regulated class one Oops, either down-regulated class one or, um, I'm missing it, oh, there it is, uh, or lost antigen expression. So this is classic immunoediting. How you do the experiment affects how the immune system sees the tumor, affects the results that you get. Context matters. Another example of context mattering is that in contrast to the situation that I've just been telling you about where we induced lung cancers using this antigen expressing virus uh, and we observed immunosuppression as the mechanism of escape. When Michael injected the same virus into the exact same mice, but not in the lung, but instead in the leg, in order to develop sarcomas, there he found a very different result. In this situation, the immune response was very active. And the only tumors that ever grew out were ones that had lost antigen expression. This is, again, classic immunoediting. So the conclusion from this uh, set of observation is, again, that context matters, not one-size-fits-all explanations, and you better believe that's going to be true in human cancers as well, in spades. So we have to keep an open mind about what's controlling what in different patients and in different tumor sites. So if we now focus on what is contributing to immunosuppression in the lung cancer model, there are many possible answers. There are many, for example, checkpoint regulators, some shown here and many others that are being explored in the clinic as well as many cellular factors that are known to be present in the tumor microenvironment, like regulatory T cells that we'll talk about, but also M, uh, MDSCs and macrophages, which also can contribute inhibitory signals to control immune responses. We know that PD-1 is upregulated in these exhausted T cells. Um, that's not surprising because antigen experienced T cells usually upregulate PD-1, but it's also an exhaustion marker, and it's also the target of a checkpoint therapy. And so Amy Lee in the lab decided to ask, would PD-1 restore immune responsiveness to these exhausted cells in this model system? So we received 
antibodies from Gordon Freeman and uh, Arlene Sharp. And perhaps to our surprise, in contrast to control tumors shown in black, which continue to grow, the PD-1 treated tumors likewise, in general, continue to grow. PD-1 is ineffective in this model. And so we're now exploring various combinations to try to improve this response. You might argue this is a good result in the sense that it allows us to discover new combinations that might be more powerful in this setting. Uh, and indeed, Daryl and colleagues are figuring out very complex methods to try to treat tumors just like this, and they're making some progress. I want to turn to one other factor, which we suspected might be important here, and that is the regulatory T cell. Uh, I think you probably are aware that regulatory T cells are an important negative regulator of immune responses. They have pleiotropic effects uh, directly on immune cells as well as other cells. They are known to be important in part because humans and mice that lack regulatory T cells have very active autoimmune phenotypes. So you need regulatory T cells to control immune responses in the periphery. Nick Josh in the lab asked the question, might regulatory T cells be important in this model? And the first thing he did was to count up the regulatory T cells at that late stage where immunosuppression is taking place. And indeed, they're increased dramatically. Tissue resident T regs increase by 20 fold. Uh, so that's good in the sense that they're there, sort of guilt by association. But are they really important? And the way we could ask that question is to get rid of them in an established tumor and see what happens. And fortunately, Sasha Rudensky's lab had made uh, a FOXP3 diphtheria toxin receptor knock-in mouse that allows you to deplete regulatory T cells pretty selectively by treating the animals with diphtheria toxin, crossed all those alleles together, generated tumors uh, in these mice. These are antigen-expressing tumors. And then we could deplete regulatory T cells by the addition of diphtheria toxin. You can see that they get depleted quite readily here. And then we could ask the question, what happens? And we had to ask the question 12 days later, because if we waited any longer than 12 days, these animals died uh, or had to be sacrificed due to autoimmune responses. We're getting rid of Tregs throughout the animal, so we're getting pretty significant autoimmune responses in these mice. The question for us is, what happens in the tumors themselves? So this is what happens. Uh, this is an, a before picture. Regulatory T cells still present here. This is a juicy red tumor, very healthy and growing. Here are the T cells hanging out on the edges, doing nothing. There are regulatory T cells surrounding those cells. If we now add diphtheria toxin, deplete the regulatory T cells, this is what we observe. Massive proliferation of T cells, massive infiltration of T cells and other immune cells uh, as evidenced here. This is another uh, micrograph where you can see both CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, and I can tell you also that there are macrophages flooding into the tumor. So regulatory T cells are having an important inhibitory effect. If you get rid of them, you see massive inflammation into the tumor, as well as overt tumor destruction. So this is a good clue that if you could inhibit or eliminate Tregs in the tumor microenvironment, that would be a good thing. But I underscore in the tumor microenvironment because you ha can't do it everywhere. If you do it everywhere, you're going to induce autoimmunity. So you need to figure out a better way to kill regulatory T cells, eliminate them, or inhibit them directly in the tumor microenvironment. Some of you might know that CTLA-4, ipilimumab, is thought to function this way, at least in part. Um, but we think there might be other ways. And Amy Lee in the lab is now profiling these regulatory T cells in order to discover proteins, pathways that we might be able to inhibit directly in them in order to do a more selective job. OK, so I'm going to finish up by talking to you about a separate story. And Anna mentioned that uh, I've just started a company called Equipoise Therapeutics. David Rollet is the co-founder, along with Bill Haney. And this is a, a, a company that we've started based on recent research in my laboratory and longstanding research in Rollet's lab and other labs that implicate natural killer cells as another tool to control anti-cancer responses. So you may know that natural killer cells, which were discovered in the mid-1970s, are known to have a role in cancer. Epidemiological studies show that for many cancer types, patients who have high levels of NK cells in the tumor microenvironment have better responses. Likewise, in mouse models, if you inhibit or eliminate natural killer cells in genetically engineered models of cancer, as Rollet and others have done, you get more tumors. So NK cells are involved in immunosurveillance, uh, at least in certain model systems. 
Leah Schmidt, graduate student in my lab, asked the question, are NK cells involved in this tumor model? And interestingly, she found that in the KP mouse that I've been telling you about, you can find P40, uh, NKP46 positive NK cells, but interestingly, not in the tumor proper, again, just hanging around in the tumor microenvironment. And if she, if she does functional studies on those NK cells, they look like immature cells, where non-functional NK cells. So that led to the question, could we do what DuPage did for T cells, but for NK cells? Could we induce NK cell function in the context of these tumors, and would that help? Now, to understand what Leah did, you need to understand a little bit about NK cell biology. There's just one slide here. NK cells function by binding to ligands on the surface of their target cells. These target cells might be cancer cells, they might be virally infected cells, and these ligands bind to activating receptors on the presence of NK cells. These activating receptors then turn on killing programs and cytokine release programs that eliminate the target. But interestingly, there are also negative regulators of NK cell function, like MHC class 1, that bind to different receptors, inhibitory receptors on the NK cell that keep them from destroying self. Okay, so it's a finely balanced system, and the key is whether you tip the balance towards activation or inactivation. And as I mentioned, these cells do two important things. They kill directly in much the same way that T cells kill, and they also release cytokines to attract other components of the immune system. So to stimulate NK cells in the tumor microenvironment, Leah expressed an NK ligand. It's a viral ligand called M157, which binds to a particular NK receptor called Li49H. Uh, and in this way, she hoped to be able to induce the expression of the ligand in established tumors and then ask whether NK cells come in. She did this, again, using a bifunctional antiviral vector that carries uh, Cre on the one hand and this viral ligand on the other. And she did it also in a DOCS-dependent fashion, so she could induce the expression of N157 in already established tumors. So the experiment is illustrated here. You introduce the vector or controls into these tumor-bearing mice, and then you add doxycycline at some fixed time point, and then you study thereafter what happens with respect to NK cells, other cells, and the tumor cells. So what did Leah find? What she found was, satisfyingly, that if you induce the expression of NK ligands in an established KP tumor, you see a significant increase in the number of NK cells. That's illustrated here. And importantly, and as expected, a high proportion of those NK cells were specific to the ligand that they were seeing. They were Li49H positive. This seemed like a specific interaction. This is a fairly gross measure of having NK cells in the tumor microenvironment. Importantly, we wanted to attract NK cells directly to the tumor. And so Leah then did immunostaining, just like I told you before. And in contrast to a series of controls, which show you what I said earlier, that you can find NK cells, but they're hanging out at the periphery, if you induce an NK ligand in the tumor, and that's all you do here, um, you see a significant increase in intratumoral NK cells. All you need to do is express a ligand to attract NK cells to the tumor microenvironment. And interestingly, that's not all you do. In addition to increasing NK cells in the tumor microenvironment, you also induce inflammation involving T cells and B cells very significantly. This was true of M157, that viral ligand. Leah did the same experiment with a natural NK ligand called Ray1 delta, which binds to NKP46, and she saw the exact same thing. Increased NK cells, increased B cells and T cells. And those data are quantified here. You can see both for M157 and Ray1 delta, most of the tumors now show infiltration uh, compared to controls. Now that's important because, as Daryl was saying, one of the limitations in T cell-based therapies is getting the T cells into the tumor. And here it appears that NK cells can do that by attracting them, presumably through cytokine release. So, We've shown that NK cells, when attracted to tumors in this fashion, um, can release cytokines, induce the expression of B cells and T cells. But the big question for us is whether this induced killing. We thought we would see NK cell mediated killing, or possibly B cell, T cell mediated killing taking place within those tumors. But actually, unfortunately, we did not. Uh, here's another one of these tumors. You can see infiltration of, of lymphoid cells here. But if you do assays for um, anti-tumor effects, just histological or cleave caspase 3, you actually see rather little. 
So recruitment of NK cells by themselves, at least, in this model system, seems insufficient to drive uh, anti-tumor responses. So the last thing that Leah wondered, and the last thing I'll share with you, with you, is whether this is due to the fact that these tumors lack T cell antigens. Yes, we can get T cells into the tumor, but they don't have anything to see. And so maybe there's no way for them to kill. So to ask that specific question, Leah did the following experiment. She made what she calls a hybrid model, where she has not just NK cell ligands to be expressed in the tumor, but also the expression of those same T cell antigens that I told you about before that succeed in recruiting and activating T cells. So the experiment is shown here. She produced tumors that express just the OVA T cell antigen or a combination of the OVA T cell antigen and M157, allowed these tumors to develop to ask whether the addition of NK cell ligand expression would change the response. And this is what she found. Uh, here is the situation with OVA. You still see tumors outlined in black here. There's a fair number of them. They're fairly large. But you can probably appreciate that the addition of the expression of an NK ligand has a significant effect. And that's quantified here, both with respect to the number of tumors present and the average size of tumors in these lungs. The expression of NK ligands has a significant effect. And so this tells us that there can be synergistic activity, or at least additive activity. I would argue it's synergistic activity of NK cells and T cell directed therapies. And that was the basis for our starting this company, to try to do what we've done just there in mouse models, but in humans uh, using protein-based therapeutics. And so returning to a slide, a stylized version of a slide that Daryl showed you, uh, this so-called tail of the curve that's being observed with T cell-based therapies, the field is very keen to learn, are there new therapies that can be added to those therapies that will boost these responses? And we think that NK cell-based therapies might be one uh, to lead to more impressive responses. So I'm going to stop there, skip over one last thing for lack of time so we have time for questions. I'll just mention that we are, in fact, in addition to being interested in uh, immune-based therapies, beginning to explore immune-based prevention strategies, not something that the business world is terribly interested in, but scientifically and for public health reasons would be a really good thing to do. Uh, and those are early stages, but we're actually quite excited about what we're starting to see. And so I'll stop and thank the folks who did the work. Most of the early work was done by Nick Joshi, following on research from Michael Dupage, and Leah Schmidt did the NK cell work that I ended talking about. Thanks very much. All right, we have five minutes for questions. Hi, um, Mike Chow from Harvard Medical School. Curious, um, normally N NK cells target uh, cells that have no MHC receptor, as you showed on your diagram. Um, you wonder, I'm wondering why they might be failing. If you have this immune editing that you talked about earlier, um, do those cells in the tumor actually have no MHC1? Or, or, so or this, is a, this is a very good question. You're, you're right that cells which have MHC class 1 will send inhibitory signals to, t to, to NK cells. Those tumors, we didn't profile the very ones that I just showed you, but previous work, we had profiled uh, those tumors, and they continue to express class 1. So one explanation for why we're not getting better killing is that we're getting inhibition. So a way around that is to block the inhibitory signals, which is something that we'll do in the next phase of this experiment. My name is Tina Chu. Um, you mentioned about the context matters. Yeah. It's a timing. So do you have a biomarker to guide the therapeutic intervention for a certain the disease target? <coughs> you know, and I the combination, do you right. use, uh, consider anti-angiogenesis yeah. treatment along with uh, so the we immunomodulation? Yeah, we haven't directly looked at anti-angiogenic therapies. Um, and we're only just starting our efforts to understand the, the pathways that dictate um, better or worse responses in these model systems. And other groups are doing so as well. Tom Goyevsky's lab, for example, is shown in model systems like this, that the wind signaling pathway is an important determinant of successful T cell infiltration into the tumor microenvironment. And we're, we're doing experiments like that, including doing genetic screens to look for pathways which, if inactivated or activated, lead to better immune responses involving both the T cell component as well as the tumor component. 
So it's at the very beginning. We've kind of established this platform, which I think allows us to begin to study the factors that regulate those, but we haven't actually discovered any to date. Yes. There's no doubt that timing matters, and others who've done immune-based therapies have shown pretty clearly that the timing of, including the timing of combination therapies, will uh, influence how well the immune response. But this is a perfect example. The timing question is a perfect example of what I was trying to say before. I agree with you that timing is extremely important, but imagine how difficult it would be to do a thorough, conclusive experiment related to that in human patients. Very, very challenging. So we need better predictive models um, in order to explore the various combinations that could be envisioned. Yes. 